success or freedom? And do you have to give up one to have the other? And what happens when your quest for both fails? Let's break open the piggy bank and go all in with Jerome Myers next. This is a dash of grit. Recipes for success from courageous leaders who overcome challenges and build great things. Now, podcasting from Spire to leaders in local communities like yours, here is Brian Leflock. And let's get cooking. So listen, I do my research and I know I'm on the right track when I bring you a guest. When you look at him on LinkedIn at Jerome Myers, you're going to find up to five different businesses that are all currently present. He doesn't leave anything behind. He's got them all going right now. And that's when I know you're on the right track. Our guest today, Jerome Myers, he's known in his circle as the preeminent authority on dream realization. And if that doesn't get you rolling, nothing will. He's the founder of Myers Methods, dealing with multifamily realty investments, as well as many others say hello to Jerome Myers. Jerome, thank you for being a guest on The Dash of Grit. Brian, I'm so thankful to be here, man. Thank you for making some time for little old me. Let's little have old you. <laughs> Aren't we all little old in the in the span of things? Um, I think that's what Dash of Grit is all about, Jerome. I'll let you know that our listeners are in spots where they wish that they had it as good as everyone else. You know, everybody else is super successful. Everyone else is the preeminent authority on dream realization, right? And little do they know there's no overnight success. So we're going to talk about that today, okay? It's all good. Let's do it. Before we do, can you tell me what's great? Tell me your level of success. Tell me the good things that are happening to you. Tell me the things you're proud of, because we're going to talk about the grit that got you here next. But first, build yourself up a little bit, pat yourself on the back and tell us what's good. Yeah, I mean, at the simplest level, man, I'm a corporate America dropout. Before leaving my corporate career, I built a $20 million division for a Fortune 550. The reward for that was laying people off two years in a row. Huh. And I just wasn't cut out for it. The first year we did it, we had $6 million in profit that year. He's like, yeah, we're going to lay off half these folks, Jerome. You can do it or somebody else can do it, but we recommend you do it. And so I went back to those days of kickball where you got to be team captain and you get to pick your team. And so I wanted to pick the best and the brightest from that bunch so that we can go on and do the same thing. Promised myself I'd never do it again, Brian. Mm -hmm. And then fast forward to Thanksgiving of the following year, doing the same thing. And I was just like, I, I can't do this anymore. And so my buddy Duran and I, we were sitting on the stoop in college sophomore year and we were doing what engineering students do. We were doing some math. And so I was paying three ninety five. dollars Two roommates of mine were doing the same thing. He was downstairs. He had two roommates. And so we started doing the math and the guy was making 700 grand a year. We never saw him. We never talked to him. And that for me was like, oh, well, you can decouple your time for money. What do you do? How do you do it? I'm the son of a soldier and a stay-at-home mom. So I didn't have those folks talking about multi-million dollar real estate investments at my kitchen table or my dining room table. And so, you know, fast forward, and we've built a pretty large portfolio and we go around the country telling people about multifamily investing, how to do it. And aside from that shiny object, we dig into how you actually become a person that attracts people to you. Help, help me understand real quick. You were sitting on the step of the place that you were renting and everybody was paying that much money and you all kind of said, you know, there's got to be a better way. And so you saw the guy that was doing it and making a ton of money. and You said, we can do this and we can do it better. Is that is that the entrepreneurial spirit that you're talking about? Okay. Without question, man. Without question. It's like, how do you actually do it? Now, the thing that we didn't know is how. We knew what. Yeah. And we knew why. The freedom, the ability to make money when you weren't there was a why. But the how was missing. And so we spent a long time trying to figure out the how. Yeah. And how much time did you spend? What, when, when were you on the step and what's to, you know, up to today? How long has that been? Yeah. So that was uh, 2002 when okay. we were sitting in the stoop. And I left corporate in 2016 to go down this path to figure it out. So we, we've been doing it for 20 years now. And so you did it for yourself and it worked out really well. And you started this company that helps other people do it. And that is going real well. And that's, that's what you do. I mean, if you could capsulate what you do for people, that's it. You help their dreams come true through real estate. That's right. I think there's a whole lot of people doing things that they aren't excited about because it pays well. And our goal is to help free those people. And the target is a hundred. We want to help a hundred people stop doing work. They're not passionate about by creating passive income through real estate. 
And what is it about you, Jerome, that make people kind of gravitate to you, that make you successful at what you do? What, what's your secret sauce? The secret sauce is really just understanding that the conduit to getting whatever you want is consistency. And then being the person who's actually consistent enough to get it. I think a lot of people run in fits and starts, but being able to run the marathon, not sprinting, but just getting to a steady pace and taking that steady pace and be willing to do whatever it takes until you get the result that you desire is a game. And I, I'm really, really, really good at helping people figure that out. And I think the other thing that goes with that is you got to have the right strategy. You know, I am a strategy guy, Brian. I been working at the highest levels with people who are running multi-million, hundred million dollar divisions, as well as people who run hundred dollar divisions, right? And yeah. what I found is that the strategy and then the consistency in the work to get to the destination is what the difference is. So let's let's talk about there's success that we just talked about. And then there's the grit that we have to overcome. And what I see a lot of times and people who listen to the show tell me, yeah, it was just good to know that there's someone in the same boat, that it's not, you know, so easy, it's not overnight success. And yet in real estate, you're kind of taught to say, look, just jump in. It's gonna be easy. You why pay rent when you can own? Just go and do it. And that's not the case either. It, we're gonna talk about your grit, but first, tell me how things go wrong in real estate investment. Oh, man. So it's go so wrong. I have a whole podcast and I've got weeks and weeks and weeks of backlog. It's called Multifamily Missteps. And on this podcast, I collect stories from war or war stories from operators all around the country. Right. And they talk about the things that went wrong, things that have went wrong for me. I bought a property. There was a broken pipe in between the toilet and the shower. I didn't know that it was on, it was broken. We turned the water on. These are townhouse units. So that pipe floods the unit that it's in. And then it floods the one that it shares a wall with. Yeah. And so we had to replace a kitchen that we didn't plan to replace as an example. Yeah. Um, yeah. We've bought properties where opossums or raccoons have gotten into the attic and then fallen down into the uh, heating coil of the no. HMOC unit, right? And yeah. You know, you turn it on and it makes a mess and it's like, oh, but that's not a very cheap expense. And I guess the last one and one that's probably the most prevalent is just doing deals with people you shouldn't do deals with. Mm. Right? When you're buying stuff that exceeds your capacity to buy because of liquidity or net worth, then you're going to have some people who are partners in your deals. And if you're not partnering with people who have the same values that you do, then you can end up in a space in a place where you're being forced to have difficult conversations that you wouldn't have to have if you guys share the same values. And so, you know, those are three that are really real for me. And I think they're very common across this industry. And so good that you're there to help people through that. And so let's, let's talk about that a little bit. So you're successful now. I know it already always hasn't been so. I know it's not so easy. Can you share with us uh, maybe, maybe the most, the, the biggest time that uh, biggest hurdle that you've had to overcome as you reach success. And you've got that smile on your face. It's the same one that every entrepreneur I talk to has like, oh man, there's 54 of them, but you go ahead and pick one. <laughs> yeah. I think the one that's probably most interesting is watching all of my revenue get erased for the first half of 2020. Right. Part of a big part of my comp is closing deals. And so when we go buy something new, um, I, I get a fee. And yeah. because I didn't buy anything new in the first half and we were working on four or five different deals. And I mean, you don't make any money for working on it. You make money when it closes because they didn't close all that money vanished. We also have a conference that we have each year and that was scheduled to happen the weekend after they locked it down and said no gatherings of more than 10 people. Mm. And so all of that revenue disappeared. And so the things that I was counting on in the first half of 2020, none of it produced anything. And that for me, is terrifying, right? Because the lifeblood of the business is cash or cash flow. Yeah. So if you don't have any cash flow coming in, what do you do? Yeah. And so what did you do? Because that's not a strange story. Hundreds of thousands of people are in that same boat in the beginning of 2020. What did you do? Yeah. So we had to dig into retirement savings. We had yeah. to pivot and decide that, hey, we're going to double down on the education business, right? There's going to be a lot of deals from our perspective that come up second and third quarter of 2021. And we want to help people get prepared for that. And so we 
we work with one one on one with people to help them start building and realizing those dreams, setting up their business so that they can be in position to actually buy deals. We do a group course on Tuesday nights where people can come in and learn about multifamily investing. And those were things that we weren't really focused on before and kind of put it in perspective. We were doing four coaching calls in January in a month. In December, we were doing close to 60. Right. Okay. And so we, we had to shift the business. One of the things that was really meaningful for me was I met a lot of people along the way who have a whole lot more experience with me than me in the space. And they were willing to do deals with me. But what they told me was, hey, Jerome, you need to be patient. We really don't want to buy stuff while people are still wearing masks. And so when hmm. people who are what I consider extremely wealthy, some people have nine figure net worths. Um, you kind of listen because, you know, they've built something and they've been there and they've been doing it for a while, or maybe their parents or their grandparents were doing it in one case. And so those things, you know, going and seeking wise counsel was the thing that was able to kind of get me through that. Okay. So other people helped you through and gave you the the insight. How did that go over though, when you come home and you're an entrepreneur and everything you're doing is face-to-face and that just doesn't exist anymore. Was there ever any thought of, holy cow, I'm going to have to find something completely different. Did you just fight through it? At what point did you want to just say, maybe this isn't going to work. We got to find something else. Yeah. I remember asking the question, like, what am I going to do? Yeah. Like, the the day that I called my financial advisor and said, hey, I, I got to go into the no-go bank, right? I got to break the piggy bank and, and pull some out so that we can get to a place where we can regen- recreate the revenue. He said, the good thing about this is, hey, you can take it out for three years because of the COVID relief from the hardship. And you can put this all back as long as you do it within three years. And that was for me, rock bottom, right? That money was just there. I was never supposed to be touched. And um, to think that I had to go in and and break the the piggy bank was um, deflating for me. Um, I felt like I'd done all the right things. Um, But the one thing that I do know, Brian, is I've been out for too long. I I can't go back in, right? It's got to work. We're always Mm going to be able to create something. And I'm just committed back to this this idea. I'm committed to do whatever it takes for however long it takes until we get the result. And the result is getting 100 people free from those jobs. Because if we help enough people get the things that they want, then – we will get what we need in order to exit and be completely free. Yeah. And, and, and when you think back, so you say, get people out, I caught on that phrase. You mean get people out of the corporate world where they're just kind of puppets. Is that what you mean? Yeah. I was soul killing thing that, that people have to go through. Yeah. I, I wouldn't call them puppets. What I would say is they're doing what they know how to do or what they've been told they should do. And they know that there's something wrong. There's a listener who's listening to this podcast right now, and they've been asking the question, is this it? And the answer is no. Mm. The next question is, well, how do I find out what else there is? And you got to find somebody who's willing to help extract you from what I call the matrix, right? And it's no different than the movie. There are people who are willing to come in and help show you a different life and show you what is actually happening. Now, will it be comfortable all the time? No. Do you have to reprogram and learn new things? Yeah. And you start stacking that stuff up. It's extremely terrifying for some people. But for those who are brave and courageous and willing to trust some folks along the way, they're able to make that transition. And then making that transition, they can go off and really impact the world in a way that they were put here to do. Right. That's the thing that I want all your listeners to walk away with is you were put here to handle a very special mission. Yeah. Right. And only you can do it. And there are people who are counting on you to do that mission. But every day that you don't is a day that you're holding someone else back. So if you don't do it for yourself, potentially you might do it for somebody else. And whichever one of those motivates you the most, I want you to cling on to that because it is here for you. And there's other people who are counting on you to do it. Now, I think I know the answer to this question. I'm going to ask it anyway, because you were feet up on a desk in a corporate situation on the fast track and rocket and you were doing great. And when COVID hit that company, I'm sure they sailed right through. I don't know for a fact, but you know, a lot of big businesses made it through with some different things. It wasn't easy, but you know what I mean? 
would you, if, if things didn't work out in 2020, like they did, we're going to talk a little bit about how they've, they've improved, but if things didn't work out and you broke the piggy bank and you still failed and you were now still rock bottom, which would you prefer? Which gives you a, a chance back into that corporate world or try something completely new from scratch? From scratch, brother. Yeah, I knew you'd say that, but I don't, I, there's people out there that don't understand it. Can you explain that? Yeah. Once you taste freedom, mm. nothing is, there's no price tag that you can buy it back, right? Um, this is the thing that I think most people are scared of. We're addicted to paychecks. We're addicted to know that we're going to get that deposit that whatever day. But what happens when somebody walks in your office and says, Brian, you know, we've, you, you've done a great job for us. And I won't use Brian. Hey, Johnny, you've done a great job for us. Um, we're, we're, we're really grateful for all that you've done. But as you can probably tell, the company's been suffering through COVID and we're, we're going to have to make some adjustments. And so we're going to go in a different direction. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we, we can offer you two weeks pay. Mm -hmm. Right. I never want to be in a place where somebody could make that decision for me Yeah. again. Right. Like I had to do that for so many people that it broke my heart. You know, the thing that I, I didn't say about the $20 million division is we, I was employee number two. We had 175 people in between January 13th and, and September 30th. Right. Mm -hmm. And so then to go back to something under a hundred and go do that, that trip again, and then, Telling that having that exact same conversation less, you know, less than a year later, 11 months later, and just the the detachment from it. Right. The 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 cognitive dissonance of, oh, yeah, well, it's just business. It's not like mm -hmm. these people are relying on you paying them so that they can pay their bills. Like it's, it's just not that simple. So I would much rather bet on myself knowing that that's possible. Now, can a client fire me today? Absolutely. Sure. Can people not pay rent at the, our apartment complexes? Absolutely. There's been a lot of people who haven't. Yeah. Right? But at the end of the day, the buck stops with me now. You know, the funniest thing about that experience that I had, and this is when I realized that the illusion of control and the illusion of actually being able to move something that's like bigger than you, when I say bigger than you, like the company, was I would see people once a quarter, and I talked to them every other week or so. And when it came time to make this decision, though, hmm. it wasn't my decision to make. But I got to make all the other decisions. I got to run the business. I got to do all this other stuff. I had the P&L. But when it came to time to make this decision, it wasn't mine. Hmm. That is the thing that I want the listeners to know. You've got to know if you're ready for the buck to stop with you. Yeah. If the buck stops with you, it's a totally different conversation than, oh, well, you know, somebody else did that. So I'm not responsible. And I'm a practicer of extreme ownership, Brian. So extreme ownership where it's just this is the way it's going to be. And it's going to be my way and I'm going to take care of people. Is that what you mean by that? Yeah, that and, you know, Jocko's got a really nice book. Jocko Willis got a really nice book about it doesn't matter what happens. It's my fault. And yeah. I'm either going to fix it or I'm not. Right. Yeah. And once you take accountability for the thing, then you can actually affect change. Yeah. As long as it's somebody else's fault and they did you wrong and all this other stuff, you can point the finger at somebody else and they got to do this. As long as it's somebody else's fault, then you're off the hook. But as soon as you take responsibility for it, then you can actually cause some type of change. So you 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 broke the piggy bank and now and you you COVID happened early early 2020 happened you yeah. broke the piggy bank we all expected it to start to let up it got worse yeah and yet you've rebuilt your your business at least in some way I'm not exactly quite sure how far yet but we'll talk about that I'm interested in what you did what went right what went wrong after you broke the piggy bank even though the environment didn't really improve as much as we wanted it to, and maybe still hasn't. Yeah. So at the deepest level, you know, we still haven't bought anything. So we had to go to, like I said, we went from four to six, about 60 calls a month for, from a coaching standpoint, mm -hmm. that for us became the main revenue instead of closing deals. So you just switched the stream. 
Yeah. And I mean, we've branded ourselves as developers of people and places from the beginning. Mm -hmm. And so when you talk about all the different things that we have going on, there's a lot of different ways that we're able to affect that mission. And so while we're waiting for the real estate to make its adjustments and come back. And, you know, it's really funny if you talk to a majority of investors, they'll say, oh, yeah, you know, if I went to sleep and woke up, then, you know, I couldn't tell that COVID happened based on what's happening in my properties. And then when you get them off a recording, you hear conversations about, hey, well, this is properties having problems and that property's having problems. And so what we found is, you know, we've got, you know, five different properties that we're owned. And, you know, we've got one that's doing, two that's doing really well, two that are doing okay, and one that stinks, right? Okay. And so, you know, okay, now we got to get all of them to doing really well because that's the game. And that's when the cash flow comes off of those deals. Um, we've continued down the path. The folks who I said gave some guidance along the way, they were like, it's a great time to sell things that you don't really want to own anymore. And it's a great time to start building new stuff. And so yeah. we're on this quest to build 120 units in the market that we live in. And we've partnered with some great partners who are second and third generation folks in the business. And they are, we had the land under contract prior to COVID hitting. Um, but we just didn't proceed with the project as quickly as we would have because we want to make sure that we're out of the cycle when we come online. And I think maybe the last thing that we've done is we've doubled down on education. And so we've implemented this group model. We tested it before and thought, hey, well, we'll just do this all kind of virtual detached recordings. And we brought that back and it's like, People really want the human interaction. They want to sit across from each other, even if it's virtually. And so to be able to do that, we've got a class that's just jam-packed with aspiring investors. And so being able to do that has been another really meaningful component that we started here in 2021. And so we'll do those things and continue to do them. And then we'll hop in a conference here in March and then by that time, I think we'll be in a place where we're ready to do some acquisitions and come back to what the business we were already in. And then fourth quarter, we hope to break ground on our new construction project. And that's the way we see 2021 playing out, man. Fantastic. And, and real quick question now that the, the COVID thing, the thing that happened in 2020 had never happened to any of us before. That was brand new for all of us. And so moving forward, what have you learned that you're going to change in your your aspect of how you operate your businesses so that when the next thing happens, whatever it is, out of the blue, uh, you'll be better prepared for it. What, what changes have you made or, or ways of uh, building your business have you taken? Yeah, I think the thing that is probably most important is making sure that it's not all on one thing. Right. I, I was really intense and doubled down on we're going to grow, we're going to grow, we're going to grow, buy more, mm -hmm. buy more, more construction projects, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And maybe I was too aggressive there. And maybe the thought of, OK, well, let's do a little bit here and a little bit there and maybe going dual stream and moving things together. The thing that is really important, though, is that they all have a common thread. Right. We're educating people on multifamily investing because we're actually owners and operators of multifamily. I think what people try to do is just be totally opposite when they're trying to diversify. And, you know, I think about a lot of the thought leaders when I listen to people who've built businesses and, you know, many of them are talking about just doing one thing and just mm -hmm. doing it extremely well. But when mm -hmm. you do the one thing extremely well, if it gets impacted by something that's outside of your control, you are in a whole lot of trouble. Yeah. And so yeah. that for me is challenging. And it's not just like the business itself, but people get into this, they, they have the same risk when they do it with a single customer, right? Mm -hmm. And if you work for somebody, you've got a single customer. Same thing. Yeah, you've got one life raft, and if it goes down, you're in trouble. So tell me a little bit about the conference coming up. I know that uh, you've got it coming up. I want to hear about it, but also maybe even some hurdles and challenges that you have now that you didn't have before in filling it up and getting people to come. Yeah, I think a lot of people, I'll start there. A lot of people say I'm zoomed out, man. I, I don't oh, want to spend a weekend just staring at my computer. Um, I say, well, we're not using Zoom for one, but, you know, two, 
education, I, I don't know how else you get it outside of looking at something. Now you could be in a space where, you know, you, you can interact with people, but I just don't believe that most people are comfortable traveling. I don't believe that most people are comfortable congregating in a closed environment. And so I think this is a great opportunity for people to meet with folks from around the world and learn and engage and get connected in a ways that they wouldn't have been able to do so in the past. Um, the conference is March 19th through the 21st. It's going to start at 6 p.m. on that Friday and go till we keep adding time. It was noon. Now it's one. Now it's, it's probably going to end up being two o'clock on Sunday evening. And that's just because we keep adding these dynamic speakers. And we're not bringing people to brag about how big their portfolio is. We're not bringing people in to sell you something else. We're bringing people in to share their stories on how they got to where they are. Yeah. And to give you the tools, tips, and techniques that they've learned along the way so that if this is something that interests you, you're exposed and then it can help you speed up your journey. Because we all want folks to get free. And whether the person that's speaking at a given time is free or on their path to getting free, it's our goal to inspire you to know that there's something else that's possible. Deron and I didn't know how to do a deal when we were sitting on the stoop in college. And we want to make sure that if anybody is actually interested in doing this, that they have an opportunity to get exposed to people who are doing it every day, because that was a gap for us. What does success mean to you just as we finish this up? Is it about your hundred families or is it about more families across the country learning how to do it? What what will you be happiest about at the, at the end of your times? Yeah, it's so success. The only real success is significance for me. Right. And so I want to be the guy that starts the ripple effect. The hundred yeah. families will impact hundreds of thousands, if not millions yeah. of people. And it won't just be this generation it'll be generations to come. And for me, that is the entire game. I want to be the guy that touches the people who make a huge impact on the world. People are going to want to reach out to you because they share the same dream. The greatest thing about doing this show is I can see people like you and I say, I can ask a question. I know exactly what the answer is going to be because there are people just like you listening to this now saying, I want to impact. I want to make a difference in the world. I know I need to make money. I know that. And I know I need to impact here, but I want to make a big splash. And I, and I think that's okay to dream for, isn't it? It's okay to want to do something really big. Yeah, it's. It's okay to do that, but it's stellar when you actually go do mm. it, right? There's a difference between a dream chaser and a dream catcher. I want everybody to go catch their dreams. Yeah, yeah. How would people find you if they wanted to reach out to you to either talk to you and pick your brain a little bit, maybe learn a little bit more about the conference? How would you ask people to, to reach out? Yeah, Jerome Myers.co, M-Y-E-R-S.co. You, you reach out there, you can see everything that we have going on. As Brian said, I got a lot of stuff going on. And so yeah. you can pick your adventure. Fantastic. I hope people will, because I tell you what, when, when people are trying to do something on their own, if they don't take the step, they'll never get it done. Right. And you sat there on the step and you said, I want to do it. Do you know how many millions of people I bet have sat on that step just like that and said, I want to do it, but never did it. You know, and you did it. And congratulations, Jerome. And I hope that you can make 100,000 people other out there do it too. Thanks, Brian. That would be phenomenal. Thanks for being a part of the show. I do want to do a quick uh, a quick shout out to our sponsor and my employer, Spire Advertising. Um, we are a marketing company that helps businesses, entrepreneurs, organizations succeed and grow. And, and uh, we like to do that for you. If you're looking for a team of folks to go to work on your project, help impact others, help make your dreams come true, that's what Spire does. You can reach out to me, uh, Brian, B-R-Y-A-N at SpireAd.com or at our website, SpireAd.com. Com. This is Brian Leffelock. I'm director of sales with Spire. Thank you to Jerome Myers of Myers Methods and five other or 10 other or however many other businesses he's got his fingers on. Uh, we thank him for being on the show and we hope that you'll come back and take part in Dash of Grit. Until then, win the day. This is a Dash of Grit. Recipes for success from courageous leaders who overcome challenges and build great things. 